time of worship. My name is Jeff Long. I have the privilege to serve here as the lead pastor and opportunity to preach most every Sunday. And I'm glad that you are here with us. Uh, we're in a study of the book of Genesis, uh, the, calling this series the gospel in Genesis, the good news in Genesis. So we come today to Genesis chapter two as we're working our way uh, systematically verse by verse through uh, Genesis and see what God has to say to us and for us uh, today. So I, I want to say this to you as, a, as, a, as a, about to read the scripture and, and, and pray for you uh, and with you. Uh, you're not my enemy. Sometimes you feel like that when preachers preach, don't you? Like, this guy hates me. You're not my enemy, and I'm not yours. Okay? Here's how I approach preaching. This is the Word of God. And <clears throat> I'm just here to deliver the mail. I didn't write it. Okay? I'm just here to deliver, thus saith the Lord. So <clears throat> I'm not apologizing. I'm just trying to prepare some of your hearts and minds that what I'm about to preach here is, is going to be uncomfortable for many of you because you've never thought about it. It's just something that's never really crossed your mind or, or you have reacted to this truth being wrongly applied in your life by someone else. So with that in mind, I want to read the word of the Lord We'll seek him in prayer, and then we'll move together through this message. So I invite you to stand. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Let's pray. God, we ask now that we would approach you as Lord of the Sabbath, that you would speak to us as the Lord of creation, and Lord, that we would respond to you as Lord of all. You are God and we are not. And we desperately need you. And we need to hear from you. And, oh, God, we need your rest. So grant it to us, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. You can be seated. This is a quote. These three verses, Genesis 2, 1 through 3, bring the account of creation to an impressive conclusion. Up to this point, Genesis 1 through 2, verse 3, there are two peaks. First, the peak of the creation of human beings, which we're going to re return to next Sunday. Genesis, the rest of Genesis 2. The second peak is the creation of the day of rest. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you are either coming straight up from uh, Gardner Park or if you turn off of New Hope Road on westbound onto Garrison, as you crest the hill, right in front of you is Crowder's Mountain. It's one of the best views of Crowder's Mountain in all of Gaston County. Now, I drive that road every day of my life. And sometimes I notice, I'm going to tell you when I notice, when it's first thing in the morning and the sun's gleaming off those granite cliffs, I see it. Bam. And I'm reminded just how beautiful God's creation is. Now, here's the deal. This mountain peak is here. And some of you have never seen it. And my prayer today is that God's going to shine the light on this peak and that you'll see it for what God has created it for. You see, in the not too distant past, the Lord's day or the Sabbath would have required no explanation. The day was basically observed by all of society. So for those of you who are young, think Thanksgiving and Christmas day, you notice how life stops, how things change drastically. Business is closed. The roads are empty. Well, I'm old enough to remember that's what Sunday used to be. That, that it was a regular occurrence that, that things 
slowed down and life as a whole of society changed. But, but something's happened and something's happened fast and it's happening faster. That both outside the church and inside the church, the argument is every day is the same. And the seventh day is just like any other day. But here's what I want you to do with me today. Instead of listening to the world, instead of listening to myself, let's listen to what God says. Let's see what God's view and intention is for the seventh day. First thing I want us to see is the good news of God's finished work of creation and the good news of God's rest. The first question I have when I look at this text is, what has God finished? Now, the word finished just jumps off the page at me because it's repeated. So when you're studying your Bible and you see something in a very short moment repeated, God's clearly wanting you to notice this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. So the word finished here means completed that the heavens and the earth were completed, all of it. And on the seventh day, God completed his work that he had done. Now, if you, if you continue to work this out and you take the word work, which can mean a lot of bad, bad things to some people or a lot of different things to people, here's what the word work actually means here. It means craftsmanship. Think about this. The Lord finished his craftsmanship that he produced. So this was not a mundane activity. This was not something that faultlessly happened. God, with brilliance, crafted the world and produced it, and he finished. He completed it. Now, before I continue, I have to pause here and make a New Testament connection. Now, I, I'm a little slow on a lot of things, but this just jumps out at me. Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross, and he says these three words. It's actually one word in the Greek, but these three words. It is what? Finished. Don't you think for a moment, friends, that Jesus is not hearkening our minds back to Genesis chapter 2. So here this mountain peak rises in the scripture of the seventh day and here rises Everest. The finished work of creation. God's dawning great achievement that on the cross he finished the work of salvation of man. Now I'll come back there. I just, just, wanted, you to, just wanted you to get a little glimpse there for a second before we keep going. So I'm back to Thus heavens and earth were finished and the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So I have a question. Was God tired? All right, let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 40. This has become, have you noticed this? This is American's favorite word. How you doing? I'm tired. Just notice. It's what people say. There's a reason we're tired, by the way. There is. If you'll pay attention to this sermon, you might figure it out. But anyhow, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. And notice the context of this. The creator of the ends of the earth. So this eternal God made the heavens and the earth. Now here's a fact about him. He does not faint or grow weary. Does not. So when we go back to Genesis chapter 2 and we ask the question, why is God rested? The one answer is not that he was tired. So God was not tired in the fact that he rested. So then I got to ask the question, why did God rest? Well, the answer is right there in Genesis chapter 2. The word because is there. And I'm, again, I'm a little slow, but because is answering the question. Because on it, the seventh day, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So God rested from his workmanship that he has accomplished in creation. 
And before I really get into answering why, let me just throw a couple words out because we, 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 we need to make sure we're not filtering this through our American view of thinking. So if you open the dictionary, the word rest, it means an instance or period of relaxing or ceasing to engage in strenuous or stressful activity. So again, I ask the question, was God stressed out? Was, was he, did he extend himself too far? Was he out of breath? No. So, so rest as we mean rest is not what this means. Now, here's what some of you think the seventh day is. It's the day of leisure. The day, leisure means free time for the pursuit of pleasure. So <laughs> was God just chilling in a hammock on the seventh day? Just having a little free time? Is that what he was doing? N no. So what is he doing? First, God in his resting is declaring to us that his work as creator is complete. He's saying to us, as has already been repeated, that he's finished and the statement of his finished work is the fact that he rested because the word rest in the Hebrew means this. This is really hard. You ready? Cease. God ceased from creating. So why would God cease from creating? The answer, it's plain as nose on your face, it's done. He's finished it. He has completed it. The second reason that God rests is to express delight in the creation. Now you see this in Exodus chapter 31, verse 17. It is a sign forever between me and my people of Israel that in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now the refreshment of God on the seventh day was a refreshment of joy as he contemplated the beauty and the perfection of all that he had done. God was pleased. And the fact that he was pleased is why he rests or he ceases because he's taking delight and being refreshed in that which he has done. Number three, God rests on the seventh day to give us a picture of the rest that he's going to provide for man. Now, this is a weekly pattern of how God has designed the world to work, how he's designed you as a human being to function, how you're, how you're designed in the world to live with, with rest. Even the pagans, you can study this in ancient literature. Homer refers to it. Uh, Alexander, uh, Clement of Alexandria refers to it. They're, they're not even believers. They're not even exposed to Christianity. They talk about the seventh day. So this, this was a pattern that people saw. This is only a modern phenomenon that people are going, well, yeah, hey, you know, we don't, we don't need this. So God was saying this is a pattern that you need in life, but, but God's doing something more here. Now I'm going to come back to this again, but I'm just going to kind of hit it out here. Notice this. Every day, one to six, ends, and it was morning and it was evening the first day. It was morning, it was evening, the second day, et cetera, et cetera, except the, day, the seventh day. There's no mention there's no mention of morning and evening the seventh day. What's this pointing to? It's pointing to what God's going to do. That God is going to bring us into his eternal rest. He's going to bring us into his presence. Into the joy of who he is. And that through Christ our Lord. Now, question. Is God still working? If you mean creating, the answer is no. God is not still creating. And in that sense, he is not still working. But is God still working? The answer is found in John chapter 5. Now, this would be worth meditating on this afternoon and spending some time in your Bible and thinking through what this day means because the Pharisees had it all upside down. They were all messed up about it. And here's what we're doing, quite frankly. Many of you are reacting to the legalism of your past and what you grew up with, and therefore you're throwing the Sabbath out and you're making a mistake. You're making a massive mistake. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't throw the Sabbath out. He said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And when the Pharisees confronted him because he heals a man, that's what's going on in John chapter 5, when he heals a man on the Sabbath day and does a work of mercy, and they, they basically, their argument is, why couldn't it wait till tomorrow? You could have waited another day to heal this guy. Jesus says this, verse 17. 
Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Now let me just grab an example. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You know what it says? We, that is believers in Christ, we are God's, you know what the word is? Workmanship. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new, what? Creation. And God's not creating from nothing here. He's working in the one created and made in the image of God, and he's recreating. He's making new. Then it says this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. For it is God who is at work in you, new creation. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, God's at work. He's at work right now. He's at work in us and through us and for us. Now, back to Genesis 2. I have a question for you now. I'm going to press in with you and me. Should I ever rest? Should I ever, let's make sure we're saying the word right, should I ever cease? Psalm 46.10. Cease striving and, what's the rest of the verse? Know that I am God. The answer is, you betcha. We need to cease and know. And God's got a design for this. It's the good news of the holy day. We we use the word holiday in the English. It comes from Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Holy day, holiday, you get it? Day set apart to where we cease from our work. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So God blesses this day. By blessing this day, God is assigning special purpose to the seventh day. Everything else God created, he said it was good. In fact, he said it was very good. But on the seventh day, he sets this day apart and says it's holy. That's what it means, set apart. He sets it apart as a special day different from these six other days. Now this holiness derives from God himself because God is holy, God is set apart. So this is what makes God like anything or anyone else. So when he says this day is holy, it is unlike the other days. Why? Because God chose it to be. As I am holy, you be holy. That's in 1 Peter 1. But God's saying he has set apart this day. He has saved us to be holy and he has set apart this day for holiness. Now, this day is the first thing sanctified in the Bible or set apart in the Bible. So this day has a special status. It's a sacred day. Now track with me here. Are Christians to glorify God in every area of their life? Are Christians to glorify God every day of their life? You're right. The answer is yes. But there are those who would say every day should be set apart for God. Now this sounds pious. We should count every day as a day lived to the glory of God. But the setting aside of one special day is not a human idea. God set aside this day as a pattern for us to follow. And for us to treat every day as the same is the height of arrogance. And it says, God, we're wiser than you. Isaiah chapter 58. Now, here's what I realized while you're flipping over here. Most of you in this room, the vast majority of you in this room, have given very little thought in your, in, in your life to Sunday or to the Lord's Day or to the Sabbath day. Now, some of you grew up to where you weren't allowed to walk but so many feet from your bed to the car and from your car to the church and then back to, the, from your, to your car, back to your house, 
to sit at a meal that was prepared the day before to get up from the meal and go back to your bed and stay in your room the rest of the day. There are people who are raised like that in here. And it's not a joke. But that's how strict and stringent the Sabbath was, was to be kept. Now, God has a different intention for this day. The word is delight. Delight. Now, watch this. If you turn your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own way or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the day. No, what does it say? Then you shall take delight where? In the Lord. All right, so God's got a reason here for this day. It's not, and we look forward to Sunday every week. It's kind of the way people talk about Friday. And we look forward to Sunday every week so I can do whatever I want to do, you know, and I can just, I can unwind and do my thing on Sunday. No, 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 no. God has set apart this day that you would take your delight in the Lord. So therefore, he says, don't turn your foot to the Sabbath. Literally what it means, don't trample it underfoot. Now what do you, I'll say it this way. Do you think about what you're walking on? You consciously walk around going, oh, oh, no. We just walk wherever it is we walk and we don't think about it unless there's a sign that says don't walk here. Now here's what God's saying. You're trampling my day under your feet. You're treating it as it's insignificant, as if it doesn't matter. And if you'll stop doing this, if you'll stop doing your pleasure, in other words, if you'll stop doing what you want on my day, and you will honor this day as a holy day of the Lord, not going your own way or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then here's what God has for you. Look at this. Himself. Then you will find your delight in the Lord. Now, friends, I want you to think about this illustration with me. Pretty much, Memorial Day is still observed. Most of you get the day off from Memorial Day from your work. Memorial Day is a day set aside to remember those who gave their life on the field of battle so that we could experience freedom. Now, sadly, a lot of people have cookouts on Memorial Day and have no idea why they stopped and have a day off and why they even have a cookout other than it is, quote, now the beginning of summer. But we still get the day. Now, <clears throat> we set apart that day to remember something important, to bring our minds back to how we came to be as a people and how we've sustained as a people because people gave up their life for our freedom. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. God is saying to us that the Sabbath is important enough not to observe it once a year. God is saying it is important enough that you observe it every week. That every week, we should say, Jesus is Lord in a significant and profound way to our hearts and minds. Now, turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. You'll notice I've said seventh day, Lord's day, Sabbath, and I've said the word Sabbath occasionally. Now, what I want you to see as, 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 we're, as we're moving through this is that the principle of the seventh day that God set apart as holy remains. Remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who's within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, I, want, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, the Ten Commandments reveal God's moral law 
that is true for humanity. And here's what you'll find. In cultures that don't even know the Bible, they know these ten things are necessary. But here's here's what's happened in the last 50 years. We've looked at our Bible and said, well, you know what? Not all the laws of the Old Testament still to be kept. Some of them were temporary. I agree with that. Some of them were temporary. They were tied to the temple. But folks, you cannot dig into the Ten Commandments and say some of them were temporary. Because the only sum we're looking for is this one. And here's why this one ought to rise to significance when you're looking at it among the ten. It is the only one God gives you commentary on. Explaining the significance of it, how it is to be kept, and where it came from. That it came from the fact that God set this part day apart. So we must observe and see that God is calling us to experience his special presence and his help by keeping what he has laid down the principle of the Sabbath or the seventh day. Now, here's where the rub comes. How human beings participate in the rest of the seventh day is not spelled out explicitly. But it must have implications for us. It will include imitating God in stopping the activity of work in order to rest, which must not just include spiritual rest, but it, I mean physical rest, but spiritual rest. So let me say it this way. This is probably the most important sentence outside of the scripture I've read that I'm going to say. What I cling to and give myself to on the seventh day reveals what I worship. What I cling to and give myself to on the seventh day reveals what I worship. Now, you notice I didn't use the word Sabbath right there. Because here's what you could argue. Well, I don't believe in the Sabbath. I don't, think, I don't think Christians have to keep that. Or I don't keep the Sabbath. I'm not a Christian. Okay, I don't care if you're not a Christian. My sentence holds. Every seven day, this day's coming around again, Right? So what you do on the seventh day that God designed in you as a human being and for all of humanity, what God designed for you to cease, what you do on that seventh day reveals what you cling to and what you worship. Now, some of you are going to come up and ask me a question. Well, pastor, what can I do on the Lord's day? What can I do on the Sabbath? Well, I can give you three answers to the question besides ceasing and worshiping. First of all, we don't do nothing on the Sabbath. We give ourselves to works of devotion. We ought to give ourselves to serving the Lord day in and day out, but, but on the Lord's day, we should give ourselves particularly to works of devotion to the Lord. So people say, well, you, you work on Sunday. Yes and no. Since I went to three services, I work on Sunday, okay? <laughs> I'm whooped at the end of Sunday. But no, I can think of nothing I would rather do on the Lord's day than preach. This is what God made me for. This is what God gifted me for. Listen to me, listen to me, don't miss this. God has administrated his gifts into the body of Christ. And God's made all of you to participate on the Lord's day. And here's what we've become. We've become a society of consumers, even at church. Where we're religious consumers and we just come and get instead of give. We're to give ourselves to works of devotion. Second. We're to give ourselves to works of necessity. You need to eat today? Yeah. And, and, and food needs to be prepared and you need to consume it and hopefully you'll clean up afterwards so it doesn't stink by tomorrow morning in your house. But we need to think about necessity, works of necessity, things that are necessary. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not judging here. I, I'm, I, I, I eat out on Sunday, but this is a legitimate question that I have to ask myself. Is it necessary for me to do that? Because right now, 
We are forcing people to work a job so that we can go eat after church. Is that necessary? So works of necessity. Number three, works of mercy. I went to see my grandmother on Sunday afternoon about a month and a half ago, and I noticed something very distinct. Two people entered that nursing home besides me and my daughter. Two. There was a day that if you went to a nursing home on the Lord's Day, people would file in and out of that building all day long. Here's why. Because people understood that works of mercy were to be done on the Lord's Day. That we were to remember the lonely and the hurting and the people whom Jesus reached out and touched. So, simply stated, the Lord's day is not leisure day, friends. It's not what it is. That's not how God intended it. God intended this day to be a day where we encounter him and serve him. Last and final question. Have I entered God's rest? You say, what? Here's what some of you hear when I say that. Have I entered God's rest? Well, pastor, I'm not dead. You sound like somebody standing up at a funeral, our beloved sister, as he entered her eternal rest. That is not what I mean. Have you entered God's rest? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. This is Jesus now. Come to me, all who are labor, who are weary. That means you've worked to exhaustion. Come to me, all who have worked to exhaustion and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you. So this is not inactivity now. We don't enter into a state of inactivity. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. St. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. We are restless inside of ourselves until we find our rest in God. And Jesus has come to restore God's rest by establishing fellowship with God through his death on the cross. And what he offers today is rest to the weary. So if you hear this sermon, I'm just trying to burden you down with something else as a Christian that you gotta lay on top of yourself, you're not hearing the gospel. What I'm saying to you is I'm watching you as a pastor live exhausted lives. Going, 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 destroying your children in the process. And God is saying to you, come to me. You're not going to find it anywhere else, friends. Come to me, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. And once you establish that rest, then find the pattern of life of weekly, weekly setting us out a day to cease. Hebrews chapter four. Unfortunately, Hebrews chapter four is used by some people to explain away the keeping of a seventh day, which is unfortunate. It's not what the writer of Hebrews is doing at all. What the writer of Hebrews is doing is confronting legalistic Jews who thought they were saving themselves through their works and to see the gospel. He says this, therefore, while the promise of entering that rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Now everybody look up here. What's he talking about? He's talking about the children of Israel whom Genesis chapter two was spoken to for the first time to the children of Israel through Moses. 
who God was promising rest. And they didn't experience it. Chad read it to you at the beginning of the service. Psalm 95. Today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You see, the children of Israel did not believe God. And because they did not believe God, they did not enter his rest. And watch this, watch this. For we who have believed enter that rest. Verse nine, Try, stay with me here. Don't take a commercial. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. You say, Pastor, I don't get it. Listen to me. We rest from our labors because our hope is in the Lord, not in our labors. You say, what do you mean? You see, sin is the reason for my restlessness. Sin is the problem that must be dealt with, and I can't deal with it. There's nothing I can do about it. But Jesus not only can, he did. And on the cross, he finished the work of the payment and the penalty of sin. And he uttered these words, it is finished and he swung the door wide open that we can enter his rest how it's this simple when i reject that i can save myself when i reject that there is anything i can do to earn god's favor when i reject that i am not my own person you see, here's your problem with the Sabbath day. Your problem with the Sabbath day is the same problem you're having with salvation. It's mine and I'll do with it what I please. It's my life and I'll do with it what I please and you are not telling me what to do. And what the Sabbath reminds me every day, every week, and what it reminds you of every week is, this day's not mine because I'm not mine. I'm his. I was bought with a price. Now hear me, friends. I don't know about you, but sin's got me wore out. It's got me wore out in my own life. I don't mean this mean, but your sin's got me wore out too. And pretty much Monday through Saturday, it's what I deal with. The consequences of my sin and yours. But oh, what a joy to come in with you on Sunday and together to say, death was arrested and my life began. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a taste. At rest, oh, what a taste of glory divine. But you're reminding me and I'm reminding you we're about to enter that rest, friend. And in that eternal rest, there'll be none of this. God, I got, aren't you glad how good I was, how I got here? Man, I did a lot of good stuff to get here. No, 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 no. Forever and forever with delight we will worship Jesus Christ who did the work for us and brought us into his rest forever and ever. And every Sunday is a little glimpse of that which is coming. Let's pray. Oh God, I trust, I know you have confronted much without 
any specific confrontation on particular activities and things people are doing. Because just as we read in Hebrews 4, your word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword that on in this rest, the word plummets through and speaks to our hearts. So wherever you have spoken, wherever you have pierced the hearts of men and women in this room, bring them to repentance. To those who are trampling the Lord's day, bring them to repentance. To those who are trampling over the gospel of Christ and the good news that they can come weary and heavy laden to Christ who will save. I pray you bring them to repentance. Call people to yourself, save in this room and bring us to rejoicing. We plead in the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen.